Okay, so this is going to be um, part B of the exam take up. I'm, I'm probably going to do it in two parts because uh, there's quite a lot of math going on here. So we'll go as far as we can for about 20 minutes and then I'll um, make another video to finish it off. Okay, so part B, 63 marks give complete solutions in the spaces provided for each question. Marks are shown in square brackets to the left of each question. Always important to check this to make sure that you're doing enough work to uh, give yourself three marks. Good plan, right? So it says use the appropriate formula to find the number of terms. So I'm looking for n in the following sequence. 3, 6, 12, 384. So the first thing I wanted to, to do is to determine what type of sequence I'm dealing with. So I take a look at it and I say, okay, well, it's um, definitely not, I'm going 3, 6, 12. So I'm multiplying by 2 as I go from, um, from left to right here. So 6 divided by 3 is 2, 12 divided by 6 is 2. So it's geometric. So you want to make sure you're using the appropriate formula. Remember, geometric has an R in it, in the equation. If your teacher gives you the equations, you should be looking for one with an R in it, of course. So Tn equals A times R to the power of N minus 1. And I want to find N, the number. So what else do I know? Well, I have the A is 3, and I have that R is 6 divided by 3, which is 2. So I'm trying to find the nth term. Well, the nth term is 384, right? I know what the value of it is. I just don't know what number it is. So I plug that in. 384 equals 3 times r is 2 to the power of n minus 1. So now you have to have some... Um, you know, some solving skills up your sleeve here. How do you solve for an exponent? Well, you want to get rid of this first. You want to isolate the exponent so it's just 2 to that power. So I'm going to divide both sides by 3 here. And 3 into 184 is going to go 128. So that's 2 to the power of n minus 1. Now I'm trying to solve for n. So it's best if I can write this with a base of 2. <coughs> 128 is 2 to the power of 7. So I write 2 to the power of 7 equals 2 to the n minus 1. The bases are the same. So now I can say, well, that means that 7 has to be n minus 1. And so n is going to be 7 plus 1 is 8. So therefore, uh, you should give a nice concluding statement. Therefore, there are eight terms in that sequence. Okay, so let's move on here and get this done before I make my dinner. So simplify. So now I have m plus 3 over m minus 3. It's through 3 marks. So And I'm adding. It wants me to add. So check this, right? Got to make sure you know what you're doing before you start. Is that plus or is it dividing? I think it's a division sign. My vision's not good. Yes, it's a divide. Let's make it bigger. Okay, so I want to simplify. So I'm going to start by knowing what I should be doing, and that is if I'm going to divide fractions, I need to invert and multiply. So I'm going to flip this around, put this on the top, and this on the bottom. Now, in order, when I'm multiplying, I can cancel things out top and bottom if they're the same. So right now I don't have anything that looks like I can divide, right? So I'm going to do some factoring, right? It was another big thing you did this year. So 9 minus m squared, that's a difference of squares. So that's 3 plus m times 3 minus m. Now it's probably a good idea for you to put these little binomials in brackets as well because you can't divide them out like you can't just divide the m's out here for instance they have to go with little families here right make sure you don't forget that okay and i have m plus two in the denominator so now i look to see if there's anything i can divide out and i have an m minus three and a three minus m so these aren't the same but these are kind of the same 
And what you want to do is plug in some number, any number, for m to see how they are different. So if I put in 5 for m, that would give me 2. If I put in 5 for m here, that would give me minus 2. So they're the same, but they're the negative of each other. So this goes into this one minus 1 times. That's very important. Now these two terms here, I'm multiplying, so I have m plus 3 times a 3 plus m. Well, 3 plus m is the same as m plus 3, right? doesn't matter which way I add them. So this means I now have a negative. I have an m plus 3, and it's squared, because it's this times this, I'm multiplying them by themselves, and I have an m plus 2 in the denominator. And that's all I can do, I can't simplify that any further. And when you go down here, it says state the restriction in A. Restrictions, remember, have to be found as soon as you factor. And it deals with when it's dividing, you have to watch for the numerator and the denominator. So there's actually three places I'm looking for restrictions here. That's this one. And this one, which is now a denominator. And this, which was the denominator in the initial question, right? So you have to find all the places, um, make sure you're, you're finding all the places for your restrictions. So I'm going to say m is not equal to, again, so I have 3 for this one. I have minus 2 for this. I have 3 here, so I've already got that one. And this one is minus 3. So I have three restrictions. Make sure you list them all. Okay, number three, it says simplify completely. It is not necessary to state restrictions. Okay, that's good. We won't. And I'm adding. You're adding two rational expressions. And in order to add, you need a common denominator. That's very important that you start the question thinking that. A common denominator. Okay, so I have a plus one here. And I'm adding a over, and I have these two um, complex trinomials that I need to factor. So for the first one, I'm looking for a product of minus 2 and a sum of minus 1. The second one, I'm looking for a product of 2 and a sum of 3. Okay, so 2 times 1, 3, 2 times minus 1, and the negative 1 there. So minus 2 plus 1 would give me minus 2, and minus 2 plus 1 would give me minus 1. Write them out. Don't be shy. It's good for you to, um, to write it out to make sure you don't make a mistake. So 2 times 1 is 2, and 2 plus 1 is 3. Now, make two fractions with the first on the bottom. If you didn't catch this, this is the easy way to factor complex trinomials. I'm going to simplify this one. I reduce... And this one's already reduced. This one becomes 1 over 1. And this one stays at 1 over 2. So my answer for the first one here would be a minus 1 and 2a plus 1. So I'm going to write that a minus 1, 2a plus 1. And the other one is going to be 2a plus 1 times a plus 1. Okay, so now I've got it to this point. I need to state um, what the common denominator is going to be. Don't start trying to divide stuff out. Okay, this is a plus sign anyway. You can't cross over the, denomin the numerator here. And you did this so that you could find the common denominator. So look at this. This one is the same here and here. So I don't need to do anything with that. But this a minus 1 and this a plus 1... That's going to be all part of my common denominator, right? So I'm going to have 2a plus 1, and I'm going to have a minus 1, and an a plus 1. So now the question is, how do I fix the numerators? So this one, a plus 1, is going to have to be multiplied by the a plus 1. So I'm going to do a plus 1 on this side, and a minus 1 on this side. So I have a plus 1 times a plus 1. So I had this one, and I have to multiply it by this. And this a over here, so plus a, and I have to multiply that by an a minus 1. Okay, so back to my pencil here. Don't forget your equal signs. Whoops, I broke it. And I have no more lead. Ooh, bad news. 
Okay, so let's see if I have another one in there. I'm going to expand this and I'm going to leave the denominator alone. I think that's the end for my pencil. And there's no more lead in it. Sorry guys, I'm going to have to switch over to a pan or something. Let's go darker blue. Okay, so I'm going to expand this. That's going to give me a squared, a squared plus a plus a. So that's this is like squaring a binomial, right? Square twice the product, squared plus a squared minus an a. So this times this, this times this. And in the denominator, I leave it all alone. Just leave it. Now you could, if you wanted to, write this as a difference of squares, but it's not necessary. So now I'm going to combine. Um, so I have a squared plus a squared. That's 2a squared. And I have 2a minus an a. So that's plus a plus 1 all over 2a plus 1. If you want to get fancy, you can write it as a squared minus 1, which would factor to this, right? Or you can just leave that. Now, this isn't factorable because it's looking for a product of 2 and a sum of 1. And the answer is no. So you're done. And it didn't say you needed to state the restrictions. So that's where I'm going to stop. Oh, did I do all that without you seeing it? Okay, I'll, I'll leave it there just for a second so you can see. Or you can just pause your video. I'm sorry, I'm kind of rushing through this. But I have uh, an awful lot of work to do to get this done and up for you. Okay, so let's move on. You can uh, check that on the internet. Okay, and again, remember you can download this from the PB Wiki site that I posted in the previous video. Okay, number four. It says, given angle theta, where theta is between 0 and 360 degrees, determine two values of theta such that the ratio is true. Sketch both principal angles. Okay, so you know by the cast rule... And let's write this up here. C A S T. The cast rule tells you in which quadrant uh, the various trigonometric ratios are positive. So if this ratio is positive, which it is, that means the cosine must be in this quadrant here and this quadrant here. So let's find the value of it. Remember, this is a ratio. You're trying to find an angle. So I'm going to do the inverse. I'm going to go into my calculator. It's going to do this for me equals and I will grab my calculator here because I can't remember what the answer so second cos 0.6951 equals and I get 45 about 45 point well let's say 46 degrees just for simplicity's sake now watch what your teacher asks for if it says to two decimal places then you give two decimal places Okay, so I get 46 degrees. That means there's one angle right here. So this is 46 degrees. And there's going to be another one in this quadrant that's going to be the same distance away from the x-axis. Now, don't give your answer as negative 46 degrees because the domain here says between 0 and 360. So your answer must be between 0 and 360 degrees. And that means for this one, you're going to go from here all the way around to here so it's going to be 360 minus 46 degrees and that should give you what 314 so theta is approximately equal to 46 degrees and uh, what I say 314 right 314 degrees 314 yep okay number five the graph of y equals f at x is shown on the grid below. On the grid, sketch y equals 2, f at x minus 3, minus 5. State the domain and range for the function in A. Okay, so I have here a graph, and it has some points. This isn't very accurate, but they go like this. And I'm going to choose three of these points so that I can work with them to find the graph on the transformed function. So here's my function. This is my transformation okay, of f at x. This is f at x, that half circle. So I'm going to write the mapping rule. Now remember mapping rules? Mapping rule is going to be 
x and y go to, what do I do to the x's? Well, it says x minus 3 here, so I'm going to add 3. x plus 3, and the y is going to be 2y minus 5. If you can't remember these, you should go back and check your mapping rules. Now I'm going to take a, these three points that I found on my graph. So that's minus 3 and 0, 0 and 3, and 3 and 0. So I'm going to do the calculation for each of those. So I have minus 3 and 0, I have 0 and 3, and I have 3 and 0. Those are key points on that graph that are going to help you find the transformed graph. So minus 3 plus 3 is 0. 2 times 0 minus 5 is minus 5. 0 and 3 will go to 0 plus 3 is 3. And 6 minus 5 is 1. And finally, 3 plus 3 is 6. And 0 minus 5 is minus 5. So now I have to sketch it on here. So that's pretty easy once you've done the hard part. So I have 0 and minus 5. I have 3 and 1. It's right here. And I have... What did I do? I did 0 and minus 5. I had 3 and 1 and 6 and minus 5. 6 and minus 5. Okay, there we go. So because this doesn't have arrows on the bottom of it, that means this won't either. It's going to go up and it's going to come down. That's it. Okay, so the second part said to sketch the domain and range. So, or state the domain and range. So the domain is going to be... Um, x goes from 0 to 6. So I'm going to do 0 to 6. x is an element of real numbers. Oops, that's tight. And my range is going to be y, and y goes from minus 5 to 0, right? So minus 5, y is an element of real numbers, all squished in there. Okay, so that wasn't so bad. We stayed at the domain range. There's our five points. We're clever. Okay, number six. I think I started on another page here because it overlapped. Hang on. It says, you will be scheduled to work 40 hours during the March break. You can choose the method of payment from the following. You can be paid $15 per hour. Or, okay, let's, let's just figure out what you're going to make if you make $15 an hour. So choice... One. $15 an hour. So let's say P is your payment. P is going to be 15 times 40 hours. That's going to give you what? $600. $600. Okay, now choice two. Choice two says you can be paid a dollar for the first hour. So you're going to get a dollar. And two dollars for the second hour, and three dollars for the third hour, plus dot dot dot, for forty hours. So T one matches with one. So T forty, which is your fortieth payment, is going to be forty. Right? Okay. So the right formula for this one. Well, maybe you've got some formulas that you've used. Um, so you're finding the sum of an arithmetic series. So sum of n terms. This little formula works the best because we know the first term and we know the 40th term and we're going to divide by 2. Remember that lesson? So it's pretty simple calculation. If you didn't know t was 40 here, you could still use the other, the other formula. It's just a little bit more work. So the sum of 40 terms is going to be 40, which is my number of terms, times the first term plus the last term, divided by 2. So 2 goes into 40 20 times, and I'm doing 20 times 41, which is going to be a little bit more. That's 0 to uh, 40 times 41. Yeah, that's 820. I don't know why I got 620 when I did it before. So 41 times 20, $820. So obviously you're going to pick choose choice two okay so that's that's that 20 times 41 okay number seven the graph 
of a parabolic relation, relation, see they say relation, it's not a function. Why isn't it a function? You might have to join the dots on yours. It wasn't coming through on the, uh, the printer. Okay, so it's going like this. This isn't a function because for every value of x, you have more than one value for y all along here, right? State the domain and range. Okay, domain. What's the domain? x starts here, right? It goes this way. So x goes, um, x is greater than or equal to minus 2. x is an element of real numbers. Remember, real numbers means that you can draw without lifting your pencil. And what is the range? Well, we're going to say y. And y goes from minus, well, no, y goes everywhere. Look, it's going up. It's going down. It's everywhere. y is an element of real numbers. Period. Done. Graph the inverse on the grid to the right is the inverse of function. Okay, how do you graph an inverse? Well, all you have to do is find some points and switch them around, right? So if I had minus 2 and 0, is that on the screen here? Okay, that becomes 0 and minus 2. And here's a point 1, 1, minus 1 and 1, sorry, minus 1 and 1 becomes 1 and minus 1. And minus 1, minus 1, well, we switch those around, they're still the same thing. So now I have to graph it. So I have 0 and minus 2. I'm going to use green here. 0 and minus 2. I have 1 and minus 1. And I have minus 1 and minus 1. And my parabola is going to go like this. Ta-da! There you go. Is the inverse a function? Yes, it is. Why? Because for every value of x, there's one value for y. I'm not going to write that out, but you can do that. And there you go. And it look, makes this pretty little hard again. Okay, so I think we have time to do one more question before I um, post this one. It's already 22 minutes. A stone is thrown into the air from a bridge over a river. The stone falls into the river. The height is given by this. So I'm going to write that equation out again. It should have said h of t equals minus 5t squared plus 10t plus 7. Determine the maximum height. That means they're asking you to find the vertex, right? Because they also want to know how long does it take to reach the maximum height. You know it's concave down because the a value is negative. So you're trying to find this point right here, where the x-coordinate is the time, the y-coordinate is the height. Now there's a number of ways to do this. My option would be to use the lovely little formula x equals minus b over 2a, which will give you the axis of symmetry. Once I know the axis of symmetry, I can plug that value in. I should really say t here because we're dealing with t. So minus b, that's minus 10 over 2a, so 2 times minus 5, and that would give me 1. So that means the maximum height is going to occur at 1 second. Now, if you got a negative value, then you know you've made a mistake, right? You can't, you can't have a maximum height at a negative time. Okay, so I want to know what is the height at one second, and that will give me the maximum. So I plug in my 1 everywhere, and that gives me minus 5 plus 10 plus 7. That's 12. Okay, now I'm not going to show the other methods. You could have, this would be choice 1. Choice 2 would be complete the square. Some of you might be really good at doing that. And, of course, the third option, which would be the longest one, is find the zeros. You could use quadratic formula and then add them up, divide by 2. So after you do that, you find the axis and then plug it back in, which, I mean, this is obviously the best way to do it because it's quick. Okay, I'm going to try to finish this number 9 and then that'll be it. Certain strain of yeast cells doubles every 20 minutes. If there were 350 yeast cells initially, how many will there be in three hours? So remember, the number at time t is going to be the initial number. Now we're doubling. It says it doubles, so that means I'm multiplying by 2. And the exponent here, this is my doubling time, is 20 minutes. So it's going to be some time that goes by divided by 20. Make sure that your units here are both in minutes. 
So obviously three hours isn't going to be very good for us because we are using 20 minutes. Three hours equals 180 minutes. So the number after three hours, so I'm going to write 180 minutes because I've left this in minutes. You could have put in a third of an hour here, but then you probably would not like that because I would be a fraction. Okay, so I started with 350. I'm going to multiply it by 2 to the power of 180 divided by 20. And that's going to be 350 times 2 to the power of 9. And quickly on the calculator, uh, 2 to the power of 9 is 512. And 512 times 350 gives me 179,200 cells. Okay, so I'm going to leave that there and I'll do the rest of the questions on one more video. Bye for now. Subscribe.